a reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 18, entitled, The Residents of Jambudweep Offer Prayers, text number 29. The residents of Hiranmaya Varsha experience pure love and ecstatic bliss in remembering the beautiful form of the Lord who is eternally existing as a tortoise in their abode. Srila Prabhupada herein is bringing to our attention a most essential truth that the Lord is absolute and his opulences, including infinite beauty, is absolute. And in whatever form he assumes Whatever form he possesses, it is of absolute, infinite beauty. It is a fact. In this world, the only person who is attracted to a tortoise is another tortoise. Human beings they may become attached to a little turtle as a pet. But tortoises are big. Very few people are attracted to tortoises. What to speak of love a tortoise? However, when the Lord appears as a tortoise, there is no man, there is no woman in this world, or even in the heavenly planets, that could be so attractive and can awaken such deep love from within the heart. What is a materialistic person? Someone who is attached to their own minds and senses, conceptions. Material life means to forget our relationship with God and to try to serve our own desires. Stoka Krishna Prabhu recited a verse from the seventh canto of Bhagavatam. Matirna Krishna Paratashvato Vamitopi Bidyate Grihavratana. Adanta go birvishatam tamisham puna puna sharavata charavanano. As long as we are attached to being the enjoyer rather than being the servant, then we are plagued with this disease. The disease of being attracted to the senses and their objects. How is this possible? The eternal soul that is part of God is under the conception that I am this body, I am this mind, and is relinquishing our eternal wealth of the ecstatic abode of the Lord, the loving association of the Lord, to indulge in what Bhagavad Gita calls the sources of misery of material happiness. As long as we have this attachment to be the enjoyer, <clears throat> we cannot understand the Lord by any means we endeavor, either by our own efforts or even with the help of others. We have to give up this misconception that I am the enjoyer and assume the real nature of being a servant 
Servant does not want to enjoy. The true spirit of a servant is to be enjoyed. The true spirit of a servant is to want to please the object of your service, even if it creates much difficulty for ourselves. And we find this the consistent quality of all the great devotees, in all the great scriptures, throughout history. Prahlad Maharaj did not mind his own persecutions. He simply wanted to please the Lord. The residents of Vrindavan, they didn't care if they were in heaven or hell. They only wanted to please Krishna. Ambarish Maharaj was not concerned with his own life or death. He only wanted to satisfy the Lord. This is love. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur explained that as long as we maintain this misconception that I am the enjoyer, it is like an anchor in the boat of the human form of life. This human form of life is especially meant to cross over the ocean of material existence. But however much you roll, however many good people you have on board to help you, his lardo is the anchor, is connected to the bottom of the sea. You cannot really go anywhere. So Krishna says in Gita, yegita mam prapabhyante thams tataiva bhajamyaham. As we approach the Lord, the Lord reveals himself accordingly. If we approach the Lord in a spirit of servitude, in a spirit of devotion, then the Lord reveals himself to us as he is. Otherwise, if we want to enjoy this world, then the Lord will, corresponding to our desire, reveal the things of this world as very, very attractive. Sripad Yamunacharya, he was a king, <clears throat> Alabandara. He had great opportunities for material pleasures. <clears throat> but in his famous prayer, he is revealing his heart that even the most exquisite pleasures of this world that I was so deeply addicted to, now that I have tasted the sweetness of your loving service, when I think of those things, my lips curl in distaste and I spit at the thought. How is this possible? This is not an aversion based on too much attachment. This is that he's seeing that the pleasures of this world are impediments that distract us from our eternal constitutional purpose, which is to serve the Lord and please the Lord. He's not spitting at the thing. His lips are not curling in distaste because of the particular thing that is before him. But it is the principle of these things that drag us away from our relationship with God. So here when we find <clears throat> the Lord who is all attractive, he awakens within the heart, according to our spirit of devotion, attraction to him. No one can be attracted to God without the grace of God. Premanjana churita bhakti vilochanena some people look at the deity 
and they see something not at all attractive. They see it as an idol, a diversion from real religion. Other people see the deity of the Lord and their hearts melt in ecstatic love. They're willing to give everything for that deity. There are so many stories of people for a simple deity in a temple. They're willing, I mean, they're willing to give all their wealth to build beautiful temples. They're willing to give all their energy to cook wonderful food. For materialistic people, this is incomprehensible. <clears throat> One disciple of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he was a wealthy man and he gave literally every paisa he had to build a temple for the deity of his Guru Maharaj. Every paisa he had. <clears throat> And he also arranged the architecture. He put so much practically full time. He couldn't earn any more money because he was giving us full time to build the temple. And all the money he had saved his whole life was going into building that temple. And by the time it was done, he had absolutely nothing. And he was blissful. And he asked permission from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur whether there was some little floor space in the corner of the temple where he could stay because he was homeless. <clears throat> he sold his home just to get, just to make the temple nicer. <clears throat> and he spent the rest of his life just doing menial service to the deity. And he was happy. He was more happy than anyone else in this world because he was experiencing Krishna. Now for a materialistic person, why? A deity? For those of you who have been to Brindavan, you have seen Radha Govinda Temple. Magnificent temple, unbelievable work of art. So much time, so much energy for the deity. Now from a material point of view, it doesn't make sense. Just like Radha Ras Bihari temple. The deities only cost maybe 15,000 rupees to have carved in Jaipur. But for them, they spent crores of rupees to make them happy. Does that make sense? Yes, because when Prabhupada installed Krishna, when he invited Krishna to appear in the deity, then it's not, some, it's not just a statue that costs 15,000 rupees to make. The Lord has appeared within to accept our services. And Srila Prabhupada and the devotees, they risked their lives. They went through so many unbelievable hardships and difficulties just to keep their word to the deity. Prabhupada promised, we will build you a temple here. The municipality was against them. Mafias were against them. So many people were against them. But they fought and fought and fought and built the temple just for the deities. That's love. Because Krishna is revealing himself. <clears throat> so the form of kurma is Satchidananda. Spiritual, eternal, full of knowledge and full of bliss. A material tortoise. You may like it at the best. <clears throat> but are you willing to give up everything in ecstasy to please a tortoise? No human is like that. 
But for God, he's not a tortoise. He's not a boar. He's not a fish as we know it in this world. He's the supreme controller of all controllers. He's the ultimate object of everyone's love. And in whatever form he appears, <clears throat> when, he, when we please him, he awakens that love within our heart. Shalagram Shila is just a little stone. He doesn't have a three foam building form that we can see. <clears throat> just a little stone to a materialist. The Shalagram Shila is no different than any other rock laying in the river. Yes? But how is it that great devotees, they have centered their entire lives around the service of that little stone called Shalagram? We read about that Brahmin who came to Navadweep. He was a worshiper of Gopal. He had a deity of Shalagram. His life, his soul, his everything was making offerings to Shalagram, pleasing Shalagram. What is he seeing? Yes, if we have some sense of love of God, sing a Shalagram Shila, we will see billions of times more beauty than a neophyte devotee even seeing the most wonderful darshan of the deities of Radha Gopinath in the temple, decorated with, with wonderful jewelry and garments and garlands and all sorts of incredible decorations all around. If we have love of God, we'll see billions of times more beauty in a Shalagram Shila. How is that? Because Krishna reveals his opulences by his causeless mercy in proportion to our service attitude and our love. So this is a wonderful thing. <clears throat> The inhabitants of Hiranmai Varsh, <clears throat> they don't care anything for any of the pleasures of this world or any of the pleasures of the heavenly planet. They simply want to live eternally with tears of love in their eyes, just remembering Kurma Avatar, the form of the Lord as a tortoise. And Srila Prabhupada explains it herein that according to a devotee's particular inclination to serve the Lord, the Lord awakens our love accordingly. Krishna consciousness is beyond sectarian misconceptions. God is one, that is a fact. But the, by the Lord's inconceivable potencies. He can appear in so many forms to so many people with so much variegatedness. In the Navadvita Mahatmya, <clears throat> as well as the Bhakti Ratnakar, we read about a devotee named Vasudev. He knew about Ram. He understood the various forms in which the Lord has taken in different incarnations in this world. But he particularly was so deeply attached to Varaha, the form of the Lord as a boar. Now relatively, most people consider even a tortoise more pretty than a boar, an uncivilized pig in the jungle. 
But that was his goal of life. He just wanted to have darshan of Lord Varahadev. It was his only passion. He was performing great austerities just to get that darshan of Lord Varaha. Why? Why not Krishna? Why not Ram? Why not Mohini Murti? <laughs> he wanted darshan of Lord Varahadev. That was his goal of life, his everything. And Lord Varahadev, in the place called Koladweep, gave his darshan to Vasudev. Because the Lord awakened within him the realization of the greatness of this beautiful form. In Srimad Bhagavatam, we find when Varahadeva appeared, <clears throat> the sages, the rishis, and all the devotees, they were offering prayers of love to him. They saw that he had the most attractive lotus-like eyes. His paws were the essence of all beautiful things. His hooves. Yes? And the bristling hairs on his body were just magnificent, mind-boggling in the way that they were attracting their hearts with such love. What to speak of his irresistibly beautiful nose. Now, not too many humans are attracted to the snout of a pig. But for Lord Varahadev, that snout is more attractive, unlimitedly, than the nose of any lover of this world. Because it is Krishna. He is Krishna, the all-attractive one, whose body is eternal and spiritual. And when he awakens that attraction within our heart, then what we see and what we remember is irresistible. So we cannot bring Krishna down to our mentality. This is the condition of a neophyte devotee. We try to judge Krishna through the limited perceptions of our eyes and our ears. Sometimes we see these ancient deities and they're just not as pleasing to look at as the modern deities that are carved very uh, precisely in a very beautiful way so that the eyes just see such a beautiful lady in Radharani and such a beautiful man in Krishna. Yes, the features so nice. But some of the ancient deities, there's hardly any features that we can see. They're just black stones that just have a basic shape. Yes? But we find that the Acharyas, what were they seeing? Rupa Goswami, he was warning us, if you are attached to your family, friendship, love, and home in this world, don't go to Keshigat because the form of Govindaji is there. And once you see that form of Govindaji, how can you ever be attracted to anything of this world again? He's talking about the deity of Govindaji. This is what he's seen. He's seen Krishna. So no, we cannot judge things by our material senses. When Krishna appears, our attraction should not be based on superficial sentiment. Our attraction has to be based on love. Therefore, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he has told us again and again, <clears throat> do not try to see Krishna because you cannot see Krishna. 
even if you see Krishna, you can't see Krishna. You cannot see Krishna with your eyes, even if he's standing right before you. You have to see Krishna with your heart. Kamsa saw Krishna, but he wasn't feeling love. He was feeling hatred. <clears throat> Prahlad was ecstatically worshiping Lord Nursingadev, but when Hiranyakashipu saw him, what did he see? He saw the most horrible form of death. Varahadev, Hiranyakashipu was not attracted, I mean Hiranyaksha was not attracted by him. The form of Hiranyak, of Varahadev only awakened fear and hatred in his heart. Krishna reciprocates with our devotion. And this is the difference between a neophyte devotee and one who is actually striving for real spiritual progress. Is a neophyte devotee remains too much attached to the external forms, to the external rituals. And a devotee who is actually aspiring for real advancement understands that all of these forms and rituals that the Lord has given us It is simply a facility, an opportunity to surrender our lives and awaken love. Srila Prabhupada explained that we could do out without everything else, but we must have the association of devotees and we must have the holy name of Krishna. But even the name of Krishna, why are we not tasting the sweetness and the ecstasy, all of the opulences and beauty of Krishna is in his name? It is because of our service attitude. We must develop this selfless service attitude to understand Krishna as he is. When Marari Gupta was told by Lord Chaitanya that there's no need for you to serve Ram. Ram is the Supreme Lord, all attractive, no doubt. But Krishna's pastimes are most sweet, most playful. Everyone else around you is a devotee of Krishna. Join with us and worship the Krishna of Vrindavan. Marari Gupta said, yes, I will do. That is your order. But the next day, Marari Gupta approached Lord Chaitanya with tears and begged for his permission, let me end my life. Because all night I tried to surrender to Krishna, but in my heart I could only see Lord Ram. And it is too painful for me to take my head away from Ram. I have already offered it to his lotus feet. It's not possible for me to worship anyone but Lord Ram. And Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu embraced him and celebrated the good fortune of Marari Gupta. He said, I wanted to test the faithfulness and chastity of your love for Sri Ram. So Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was most pleased Lord Chaitanya is Krishna himself, is Ram himself. The Lord is infinite, and he can appear in so many forms and so many ways and attract different people's hearts. And a devotee, if he understands his own Lord with love and devotion, then he will understand the other forms of the Lord that he may take. <clears throat> It is said that even a dog understands his master, regardless of how the master may dress. A dog, may, a master may be dressed in a business suit or 
in a simple dhoti and kurta another day, or in kopens another day. <clears throat> the master may have hundreds of dresses, but the dog will love and serve the master regardless. So similarly, when, our, when you love the Lord, <coughs> if you actually have some love for God, even when you see him in other dresses, in other forms, you can only love him. And if you, and if you do not appreciate the other forms and the other ways that the Lord is revealing himself in other religions, what does that mean? It means that you're less than a dog. That's all. Less than a dog. Srila Prabhupada emphasized this point. Shukadeva Goswami, he loved Krishna. Shukadeva Goswami is a parrot of Vrindavan, the intimate pet of Srimati Radharani. He's coming from Goloka. He's witnessing and participating in the most intimate pastimes of conjugal love with Radha and Krishna. But yet, with, with such ecstasy, he's describing Kurva, Kurma avatar, Varaha avatar, Matsya avatar, the Lord in the form of a fish. For Satyavrat Muni, that fish was so attractive, he could not conceive of letting his mind divert to any other form of the Lord. And Shukadeva Goswami is glorifying these devotees of the fish incarnation, the boar incarnation, the half man, half lion incarnation. Why? Because he loves Krishna. If you love Krishna, you love everything about Krishna. God is great. To understand how God is great is, bhak is bhakti. Now this particular form of Lord Kurma when he appeared in this world. It is a very instructive story. We know that the demigods and the demons were churning the ocean of milk with the Mandara mountain as a churning rod and Vashuki as the rope. But as they began this great chore, the entire mountain sunk into the ocean. And none of them, individually or collectively, had the power to lift this mountain. It was just sinking and sinking and sinking. It was a great difficulty. So the demigods, they prayed to Krishna. They prayed to Krishna for help. The demons, they just thought that this is some accident that's impossible to resolve. And the Lord appeared as a huge tortoise and entered into the ocean and became the base to support the mountain. Now in this regard, Srila Prabhupada explains the difference between a materialistic person and a real devotee of the Lord. A materialistic person sees when hindrances come. Either they're coming by accident or these hindrances are caused by others. But a devotee sees that behind everything is the will of the Lord and an opportunity to come closer to the Lord. Therefore, for a devotee, hindrances, obstacles, are benedictions. For a non-devotee, 
They are simply disturbances. It is a matter of perception. Nothing happens by accident. Everything is happening according to the higher power of God. Now different reactions that we may endure may be karmic. There is no doubt the laws of karma is that for every action there is an equal corresponding reaction. And everything that comes in the life of an ordinary person is simply the reactions of their past karma. But for a devotee understands that this law of karma is working ultimately under the Lord's command. Everything is happening under the Lord's command. He is the ultimate controller of all material and spiritual worlds. We are getting the reactions to our previous acts. They may be pleasurable or they may be painful, but the system was created by God. And the system was created for a perfectly auspicious purpose. Therefore, even karma, a devotee sees the all-merciful, benevolent hand of the Lord behind it. And those who are surrendering to the Lord, then the Lord personally puts us in various situations that are perfectly according to what we need to spiritually grow. And a devotee sees that. No, nothing is an accident. A devotee wants to see Krishna's hand behind everything. That even in a most painful condition, even in a most difficult circumstance, a devotee folds palms with gratitude and thanks Krishna, sees this difficulty as a benediction. and wants to serve the Lord. Now we may say that the reactions to certain things are due to our own mistakes or our own offenses, and that may be, but the fact is that Krishna has created the system that gives us that reaction for our mistakes and offenses. Sometimes Prabhupada he would chastise devotees. They would do things negligently, and then the results were bad, and they would say to Prabhupada, it is Krishna's mercy. And Prabhupada said, do not blame Krishna for your negligence. It is your foolishness. That is a fact. But it is also a fact that it is the mercy of Krishna that he's giving us a bad reaction because of our foolishness. So the fault is our foolishness, but still the reaction is mercy. The punishment is mercy. The failure is mercy. Because we're supposed to learn from it. We're supposed to grow through it. And we're supposed to take shelter of Krishna in the face of this situation. So a devotee sees even great hardships and reversals in life, that this is just a small token of what I deserve from my past karma. And Krishna, you're giving it to me in the form that it's coming specifically for my purification. Therefore, it is a benediction. A few minutes ago we heard from our dear Stoker Krishna Prabhu how he is saying what human beings fight to avoid their whole lives. He's seeing it as a benediction of the Lord. Terminal disease, 
which puts us very close to the most feared of all experiences in creation. Death. Is there anything more feared universally than death? Can you think of anything? Doesn't matter if you're Indian or Pakistani. Doesn't matter if you're American or Russian or European or African or Oriental. There's something that every, doesn't matter if you're an insect or a rat or a lizard or a dog or a cat or a camel. Doesn't matter. Whatever species of life you're in, whatever caste, universally, we're all afraid of death. Isn't that amazing? Even in the heavenly planets, they're afraid of death. Even in the hellish planets where they're suffering like anything, even they're afraid of death. And why are we afraid of somebody in this world? Why are we afraid of terrorists? Why are we afraid of dictators like Stalin or Hitler? Not because of who they are, but because they may bring us to meet with death. Ultimately, our real fear is death. But to a devotee, Bhaktivinoda Thakur prayed, Krishna, if you want, you can protect me, or if you want, you can kill me. It doesn't matter. I'm your servant. You can do anything you want with me. 